Um, thank you all for taking the time to come to this conference. Uh, my name is Nicole Hemkis. I'm a family physician in Madison, Wisconsin, originally from Orlando, Florida. So most people's first question is, how did you get to Wisconsin from Florida? Most people are going the opposite direction, and my parents keep asking me that same question. But um, no, I really like living in Wisconsin. Um, so we're going to talk about healthcare cost, um, direct pay agreements, and specifically direct primary care, which is what we do. So you've probably heard this a few times now from other speakers. So in the state of Wisconsin, we have really great quality of care. Um, you know, in Madison, we have the university, as someone already mentioned UW, we have wonderful specialists, great doctors, but I like to say to people, it doesn't really matter how great your doctor is if you can't get an appointment for six or 12 months, right? You need to have access to care. Um, so access-wise, we're kind of in the middle. Cost-wise, we're on the wrong side of this, right? So number four highest cost, I think this is according to RAND, um, in the country. Um, and there's you know, many reasons for this. I think uh, many of us have seen this kind of HMO-dominated uh, health ecosystem uh, in our state, and specifically in certain parts of the state. So kind of backing up, and again, big picture health economics-wise, you know, why is healthcare in the United States so expensive? Uh, this is something that's been debated. A lot of people think, well, Americans are just less healthy than they are in other countries. Um, you know, maybe we take more prescription drugs, we have more procedures done, um, but that's kind of been refuted. Um, so here's a graph of developed countries. This is the United States compared to everybody else. Um, what we spend on healthcare per capita and it doesn't necessarily mean that we have better care, right? I mean, the quality of the care, we can argue in places like England, France, Germany, they have pretty darn good health care in those countries. We can also see that, you know, compared to the rest of our economy, and I need to up, this slide is about five years old now. So compared to the rest of our GDP, the rest of our economy, health care costs are always increasing at a higher rate. Why is that? So kind of boiled this down to two major issues. Uh, one of them is that we have very complicated processes for everything in our healthcare system here in the United States. And I would blame the insurance company for this, for much of it. Um, I like to use the example of ordering an MRI. So as a family medicine doc, I see a patient in clinic for low back pain. You know, he's got ridiculous pain. I think, okay, let's get an MRI of your spine. So I put the order into the computer. Someone on my staff sends that through to the insurance. Uh, the insurance comes back and sends a prior authorization or pre-certification. I fill that out. I send it back. This is if I'm an insurance-based doctor in the system. Um, I send that prior authorization back. Someone on the insurance side reviews it. They come back, they deny the claim, they want a doc to doc. I have to call and talk to a doctor on the phone who has never seen the patient or touched them and, and kind of debate with them whether or not they actually need this MRI done. Uh, then finally, maybe they approve it, maybe they don't approve it. So there's a cost associated with that process. There's time and money and all the people that have had to touch that claim. Um, let's compare that to in the direct primary care environment that I work in now. If I have a patient in the office that needs an MRI done, I put that order into the computer, my staff faxes the order form to the MRI facility. They call and schedule the patient. They have it done the same day sometimes, not weeks later, not months later. Um, I remember having an uh, interesting conversation with a referral or scheduling person and to get a patient an MRI that was wanting to use their insurance locally in Madison at a system that starts with an S and ends with an M. But um, they were arguing with me over the phone about completing a prior authorization, and I said, you realize I could send this patient down the road and have this MRI done today for one-tenth of what you guys will charge the patient for the MRI. Then get that MRI done for $500 versus $5,000. It involves less work for me. I don't have to fill out a prior auth. And it's quicker for them, less expensive for them. So what is wrong in this process here? And that's going to make me not incentivized to send to the hospital when I have to go through all this extra work. Um, they didn't really have a, a good response for that. So lack of transparency, um, I know one of the prior speakers had talked about how transparency would cause 
price fixing. I don't agree with that. Um, we've had, there's areas of the country right now that have much greater price transparency and much more um, cash-based facilities for things like radiology surgery compared to Wisconsin. And they have found that the cost has gone down. Um, when there's competition, you know, I, I can use the MRI example again. If we have one place in town that does the MRI and shows what their price is versus three or four, um, you have, as a healthcare consumer, you have more uh, freedom to choose where you want to go based on cost, quality, all of those things. And I, I think in general, we see that the cost of those things, the price is driven down. And I also always like to um, talk about in what other industry do you have where you go in and get the service, and then two or three months later, you get the bill in the mail telling you the price breakdown of what that service cost. Um, I'll give you an example that just happened to me recently. I need a tree cut down in my backyard. I live in an old neighborhood. <laughs> have a 120-year-old hackberry tree in my backyard that's 90 feet tall. So the quotes that I'm getting are $25,000 to cut this tree down. Yeah, it's true. Um, but imagine, so let's compare this to healthcare, right? I would go in, I would have that service done. Two months later, I would get the bill in the bill for $25,000 and I would say, what, why? I thought this was gonna be $200 or whatever it might be you have really no power in the current system to even make a choice or decide whether or not that price is fair. Um, you can try to argue after the fact, but really they, you know, they don't ever adjust the price, hardly ever. Um, so I think if we had more price transparency, that would be very helpful. We can look at the legislative acts that have happened over the last 20 years, um, or even longer, uh, DRGs in the early 80s, which were part of how physicians are paid. Um, and then you have the HIPAA Act that passed um, in the 90s, and then especially the High Tech Act that passed in 2009, which required physicians to use electronic medical records. Um, and all of these times, it has increased the number of healthcare administrators. So this red line is healthcare administration growth versus physician growth. So you know, all of these people ha have to get paid. Um, you know, but they don't actually have any direct patient care. They aren't touching the patient. They aren't taking care of the patient. Um, but there is a, a cost associated with this. Uh, and so I think it's just important to point out kind of where that is going. Back to this idea of price transparency and kind of the, the wide variability we see in pricing. Um, and, and I'm sorry, this is really hard. I'm sure you can't read it. But so we look at things like total knee replacements. So you could get a total knee replacement for $20,000 or it could be you know, $40,000 or $50,000, depending on what hospital you go to. Um, appendectomy is on here, so they give the range of $7,000 to $35,000. Um, again, based on looking at, this is the Kaiser Foundation looking at hospitals around the country. And then this is MRI pricing. So MRI prices from $400 to multiple, this is probably low, multiple thousands of dollars. So what started to happen 10 or 20 years ago, we used to have a lot of independent, and somebody mentioned this earlier, a lot of independent physicians, primary care doctors, specialists. You'd graduate, you'd go through you know, medical school and residency, you'd get out of residency, and you'd open up a practice. Um, hang out your shingle, maybe have you, or, you know, by yourself or a couple other doctors. That is rare nowadays. Um, you know, the, I think the statistics are constantly changing, but at least 50% of doctors now in Wisconsin, it's higher, are owned by hospital systems, are employed by hospital systems. Um, we started to see large hospital systems buying up primary care doctors, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, even though primary care is not the money maker, but we are the referral base, right? So um, let's say these systems are UW, SSM, and you know, Merit or whatever you want to call these. So when UW owns all the primary care and all the the primary care doctors in town are owned by one of the various hospital systems. That allows them to control uh, the downstream revenue. So if I need that surgery, if the patient needs a CT scan, um, if the patient ha needs lab work done, you're gonna send that patient back into that system. Um, so that's why they started to employ primary care doctors. And it's not so much, uh, I've heard this you know, it's said before that uh, there's no kickback when that primary care doctor is referring into their system, but it's just kind of the path of least resistance. It's kind of the expectation, unless it's a service or something that, that, um, that they can't provide at that particular health system. So let's look at an alternative model. And again, in different parts of the country, this is very common. I would say Wisconsin, it is, we're getting in the right direction. But 
you know, we still will always need hospitals. You know, no, hospitals are not going away. We will always need emergency care, surgical care, you know, subspecialty care. Um, you know, so we'll always need that level of care. But right now we're doing a lot in hospital systems that could be done as outpatient. You don't need to go into a hospital for physical therapy. You don't need to go into a hospital for a same day surgery. When you do those things, they're, you're gonna get a higher bill. You don't need to go to a hospital for an MRI. Um, so what if we had all these independent, you know, specialist and independent facilities that were not owned by the hospital. So they're not charging you a facility fee. They're not inflating the price of that service. Um, and again, in an ideal world, we have independent primary care doctors, independent specialists um, that are part of this. So, uh, you know, one of the, the big things is, you know, can this be done in Southern Wisconsin? Obviously it can be done, I would say that uh, in many parts of the state, it's a little bit more of a challenge, right? For the reasons that I mentioned, in some cases, we don't have a lot of these independent facilities. Uh, we don't have a lot of independent doctors. You know, in the Madison, Wisconsin area, we've historically been dominated by HMOs. Um, we, do, again, don't have a lot of those facilities. And the really ironic part is that the hospital system owns the insurance company or has some ownership in that insurance company, which to me leads to all kinds of issues. Um, I remember there's a, a doc that does a lot of um, healthcare economics. I think Eric Bricker is his name. Um, and he had posted something on LinkedIn about how it was a great idea when the hospital owned the insurance because then they're going to kind of rein themselves in and control costs in that way. But it doesn't work that way, right? So when the hospital figures out they can charge more for something, they pass that increased cost onto the consumer, onto the person buying the insurance, whether that's the uh, individual person or the company. So that's why we just see costs continue to go up and up. The insurance does not have an incentive to control those costs. They will just pass those costs on to the consumer. But times are changing in Wisconsin and in our area of Madison. You know, we are seeing more independent radiology facilities. We have independent surgical centers moving in. Um, again, only two or three years ago, we didn't have these kind of options for patients. So instead of a patient, you know, doesn't have to drive an hour to get an MRI now, they can have it done locally. Uh, but we always need more of this. Someone mentioned um, Jason Sansone was supposed to present with me. So OSCOW, Orthopedic and Spine Centers of Wisconsin, uh, was the orthopedic group that 11 physicians left. So imagine what it would take for 11 out of 16 of your orthopedic doctors to leave their department, including the chair of the department, to form their own group. That's how dissatisfied they were with the current system. So all of us have probably had our frustrations with the, the current healthcare system, even aside from the cost of care. Um, you know, you need to make an appointment with a doctor, you have to wait a long time to get to that appointment. You get in there to see them, you wait in the waiting room, you get put back in a room, you know, you waited 20 minutes or 30 minutes to see them, and then you get a you know, 10 minute visit. They did a study a few years back from the AFP that said, on average, the amount of time that a family physician sits in front of their uh, patient is around seven minutes. The amount of time that they spend interviewing them, examining them, uh, counseling them, seven minutes. So that's not a whole lot of time to talk about you know, the kind of list of three or four things that you wanted to discuss. And usually I don't um, talk a lot about burnout in my presentations just because it's, it's depressing to talk about, but I have added a slide about this. Um, so I am a family physician. I worked for 10 years as an employee doc in various areas. I worked as a hospitalist. Um, I did urgent care. I worked for some small physician-owned groups. Um, kind of saw this progression in the outpatient setting of being pushed to see you know, more and more patients in less time. Um, and so quickly became burnt out with that. Um, I like to tell the story of when I was employed by Florida Hospital, which is now, it's either Advent Health or Adventist Health, they keep changing it. It's the one of the largest hospital systems in Florida. So as an outpatient doc doing family medicine, you know, I started to see patients at 8 a.m., I would take my one hour lunch, I would drive over to the hospital, round on my hospital patients, come back, see patients till five, and I would go home and do my two or three hours of charting a night. That was like a normal day as a family medicine doc, and you did that every day. Um, but that's really not sustainable, right? So, so family doctors and all doctors, I would say, are kind of uh, disillusioned with the current system. And again, this is based on a fee-for-service model where you're pushed to see more and more patients because that's how you generate revenue. 
So I, this is a, again, I usually don't talk too much about burnout, and this is an old statistic, so it's probably much higher now, but over half of docs are burnt out. Um, I don't like that term because I feel like it implies that the doctor should be doing something differently, and there's so many lectures and seminars for doctors about do more yoga, meditation, you eat better, and like then you'll be happier. Um, I, I like the term moral injury more because I think they're trapped in a system where they can't take care of the patients the way they would like to, and it's, it's kind of disheartening. 88% um, moderately to severely stressed, and over half, uh, almost two-thirds of us would not recommend this career to our children. Um, we know there's a physician shortage in the United States. This is only going to be getting worse in the next 10 years. Uh, the top graphic, sorry, it's hard to see. The green line is the United States versus other countries is the blue line. So we have less doctors per capita um, in our population right now. And they say within the next 10 years, um, so almost half of our current doctors are 55 years or older. So in the next 10 years, these docs will start to be retiring. Um, and it's gonna be scary, honestly, what happens. Um, I like to also always put a plug in and say that Family medicine docs or doctors in general are kind of a dying breed. So when a family medicine doc or primary care doctor now retires or gets burnt out, they are typically replaced by a non-physician provider, which is not the same as a doctor. Um, so our practice is somewhat unique in that, and I will touch on that later. So I, I like to always say um, this model that we do, this direct primary care model, because we are not encumbered with insurance restrictions and time restrictions, you can't get this level of care with insurance. So I, I talk to a lot of groups and I say, I don't care if you have the zero deductible, no copay courts policy. There's no doctor that's spending an hour with you. You don't have a doctor's card where you can call their cell phone after hours if you need something. Um, you know, they're not coming into clinic on the weekend if you have a sick child. Um, so this level of care is really like a concierge level of care uh, that used to exist. I think there used to be a lot of family medicine docs like this before they were kind of pushed to change the way they practiced. Um, so in our clinic, we spend an hour with patients. Uh, like I said, they, they have a number that they can text or call us after hours if they have something urgent going on. There's continuity. We offer a telemedicine specialty service, which is at no cost to the patient or the employer. Uh, where, so if we need to get a second opinion, if we need some guidance about medication management or a workup of something, we can send this through to the telemedicine uh, specialist. We usually get a response within a few days rather than months, and that's at no cost to the, the patient. So just kind of giving you a brief overview of what this direct primary care model is. And again, this is similar. You'll hear different terminology, direct primary care, on-site clinics, near-site clinics. There are slight differentiation between those, but I, I won't get into all that. Um, the model is basically the employer or the patient pays a monthly membership. And then every time you come in, there's no cost associated with that visit. There's no co-pays. So uh, whether it's a wellness visit, an urgent care visit, if you need a minor procedure done, there's no cost associated with that. Um, if we do, for example, uh, remove a mole in the clinic and we send that to pathology, you'll get the pathology charge, which is $50. Um, and that includes telemedicine. So I, I um, also like to talk about all these things in healthcare that we think are very expensive. I think one of the ways that the wool's kind of been pulled over people's eyes is that they pay such high insurance prices, the average American consumer, because they think healthcare is too expensive. Like I can't possibly afford this on my own. Um, and there are certain areas of healthcare that are very expensive. Things like chemotherapy treatments, specialized surgeries, you know, there are certain uh, injectable medications that are thousands of dollars. But 95% of healthcare is extremely affordable. If we could take it out of a hospital setting, if we could allow people to have some price competition, um, things like lab work. I mean, I just assumed I had, you know, been working and experiencing the, the system, the hospital-based system up until starting the practice. And I assumed that lab work was very expensive. Um, I remember having an experience where um, I would get my thyroid drawn once a year and I always went to the same clinic. I had Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance through my husband at the time. And so um, I just happened to go to a different UW clinic. It was a $20 lab copay. Um, and I got a bill in the mail for $240. I was like, well, this is obviously a mistake. Same doctor, same lab, same uh, you know, uh, clinic that was ordering it. Um, no, well, you have a facility charge at this different clinic. It's a $200 facility charge for this 
$20 lab, which is actually a $4 lab when you pay cash. So you are paying more for using your insurance. You, you pay every month for a thing that is actually charging you more when you have that service done. That is the irony and, and what I think a lot of people don't fully realize. Um, so these are the costs, and these might be actually a little low. That doesn't include facility charges or anything. And this would be the cost if you paid directly, you know, again, through a direct pay sort of agreement or a direct primary care clinic or an on-site clinic. So, um, you know, again, we like to point this out to say, you know, one year of membership in a direct primary care could be paid for through probably one panel of labs. Um, our clinic does dispense generic medications. Um, so we know many times your formulary of your prescriptions through your employer, you might have a 10, 20, $40, you know, co-pays. Many times those generics will be, you know, pennies on the dollar compared to what your co-pay is. You know, we, we could talk all day about PBMs and how much money they make um, for prescribing, putting certain medications on the formulary. Um, but the reality is that most people can take generic medications. There are some exceptions. We work with patients if they need to be on you know, insulin or have specific brand name medications they need. We order things from Canada if we need to. Um, and there are specialty pharmacies and things you can have agreements with for those types of medications. Back to this imaging, um, again, the things that we thought had to be very expensive don't have to be very expensive. Things like MRIs, X-rays, ultrasounds. Um, you know, if we again take this out of the hospital setting, move it into an outpatient setting, uh, a facility that's not owned by a hospital, we could save a lot in those. And then what about things like surgery? Again, you know, surgery can be very expensive. Um, I have a doctor friend that actually just had just told me <laughs> last week about having an inguinal hernia repair and he was complaining about the, the cost. And it was, tw I actually made the slide before he even told me what his cost was, but it was 27,000. And so he's arguing with the hospital more just for the principle of the matter of why is this costing so much? And he's getting the itemized list and all of this stuff. But the reality is that, you know, most of the time when you have a, a surgical procedure done in a hospital setting, it's going to cost more than if you can do that at a you know acute surgery center, um, and again, if they're transparent with you with their pricing, you know Oklahoma Surgery Center, Solstice, all these places where we can get price transparency, um, breast biopsies, thyroid biopsies. Again, th these are real life examples of how much different the cost can be. And this is just kind of showing you, um, you know, one of the things that's happened to primary care and this is partly an issue of time and the fact that primary care doctors are you know, pushed to see more and more patients in less time, and also partly an issue of training and who you are actually seeing in the clinic. Um, we do a lot less than we used to do. You know, I was trained to deliver babies and do all kinds of stuff. I don't deliver babies anymore. Um, but you know, we can do a lot of things in the clinic if we have the time to do them, if we have a, you know, a, a practice that supports that. Um, but again, one of the ironic things about systems is that they don't want primary care doctors to do a lot of these procedures, right? Because if I remove the mole you know, in the clinic and charge you whatever charge that would be in the primary care clinic, that system is making less off of that than if I send you to a dermatologist to do that mole removal. So there is no incentive to con you know, contain cost. It's better for the patient if I do it, it's, it's faster, it's more efficient, all of these things. But, you know, so this is kind of showing you what we can do. Um, this slide I just kind of throw in, this idea of high value care, which I feel like this term is kind of thrown around a lot and sometimes it's like, what does that even mean? Um, but I would say that, you know, one of the things to point out is that sometimes people think, they'll look at our prices and they'll say, you know, how can you charge $65 a month for unlimited primary care for a person? Like, that's crazy. Like, how are you doing that? Um, in healthcare, maybe unlike other industries, there is no correlation between cost and quality. You can go to the Wisconsin Hospital Association, they have a website called Price Point, and you can compare all kinds of, I think they list their whole charge master on there. You can look up things like total knee replacements, um, you know, skin procedures, any, I think it's all procedure based. And you can compare hospitals within our state and some of the lower qu lowest quality hospitals in our state have the highest prices. Um, so again, there's no correlation between cost and quality. Um, you know, again, this MRI example, when you get that MRI done and that's the same exact machine, the same radiologist reading the MRI, um, it's, it's not the fact, the fact that it costs one-tenth the price of inside the hospital um, has nothing to do with the quality of it. 
you know, some other thing I hear sometimes from employers in terms, again, going back to this idea of primary care, um, you know, I try to, my spiel is usually, even though primary care isn't actually where the most of the costs go, right? They look at the high ticket items, like they have an employee that needs to be hospitalized, they need surgery, they have a cancer diagnosis. Um, but if we look at this as a long game, right, which is the way we should look at it, both from a financial perspective, but also just from the health of your employees and overall you know, quality of life, um, really we need to invest more into primary care. Um, and somebody had mentioned, Dr. McCurry mentioned a lot, lifestyle medicine. I mean, this is what primary care doctors should be doing, right? Like I, I should be your health coach. I should be counseling you about what you're eating and how much you're exercising and how much alcohol you're drinking. But again, unfortunately, it's moved away from that because we don't have the time in a seven minute visit to do all these things. Um, but when you have an hour with a patient, um, you actually do have the time to talk to them about, you know, all of these pillars of lifestyle medicine. Um, and I look at it as when we capture that patient and you know, address their high blood pressure and their high cholesterol and, and their alcohol intake five or 10 or 20 years before they have that heart attack or that stroke. Um, we have a company that we take care of and they, a few companies that are, are factory workers. So I mean, these, sometimes uh, these are people that have not gone to a doctor in 20 years. I mean, a 45 year old guy that has not gone to a doctor since he saw a pediatrician. Um, so you are picking up things that have never been diagnosed in this person, which is, I guess, both good and bad because they thought they were healthy, you know, but um, that is really an amazing thing. I mean, obviously for that person and their, their overall health, but again, you know, to be able to catch it before it becomes something more serious. Um, you know, this is just kind of all of the stories of how we can save money in terms of when you have access to care um, and you don't have to utilize an emergency department or an urgent care. Um, we know when patients don't have access and when part of access is, is cost, right? I mean, if you have a $5,000 or $10,000 deductible, you're not going to go to a doctor unless you absolutely need to. Um, so when you make this accessible to your employees and also no cost to them, all of a sudden they can get care in a setting that is uh, much easier, more convenient, and they don't have to utilize the ER and the urgent care. Um, we've had a lot of patients where they were referred to get total joint replacements, total hips or total knees, and they see one of our docs and, and we realize, well, no, you haven't tried this yet. Okay, let's, let's do some more conservative measures before you actually need to go through a major surgery that you, you know, there's all kinds of debate now about total knee replacements. Um, you know, we've had patients where we are able to, again, navigate them to lower cost, uh, cash-based um, providers instead of them going to um, the university system to get some of these surgeries done. Uh, one of our doctors does something called prolotherapy, uh, which again is kind of a lesser invasive. It's for chronic pain, uh, for chronic joint pain. Um, and we've had, you know, I can't even keep track of how many people that were referred to get a total joint and saw Dr. Balin a few times and actually didn't need the total joint. So um, I, I like to tell the story of the broker. Hopefully he's not in here. No, I won't tell you his name. Um, so uh, when I first started the practice, it's probably about three years, three years after starting the practice, two and a half, um, had a, a patient who owned a small business who referred her insurance broker to come and talk with me. And I remember sitting with him and another broker, and they were both very skeptical of direct primary care. I mean, kind of heard my whole spiel and, and was like, well, this sounds great, but let me just tell you why this isn't gonna work. Um, and then kind of said, you know, specifically for Madison, it was like, well, you know, people here are kind of stuck up. They wanna go to the university for their care. And like, you know, why is somebody gonna drive past the university clinic to get to your clinic? And then um, one of his other um, things was, well, employers actually don't care how much they spend for healthcare. They just, you know, increase the cost to their customer the following year. You know, that's that's just a line item for them. Like they don't actually care how much how much the uh, healthcare cost. And I was like, hmm, because you know, for most employers, that is the second highest cost after payroll. Um, it's interesting though. Since then, uh, that broker we're kind of friends now, and he's referred me businesses. So things have definitely changed. Um, so we started. Pretty much the summer of 2018, I started by myself. Um, and we have since added, uh, we have six doctors now and we have four clinics. Um, we now take care of multiple, I'll just tell you what the doctors are. 
Um, I show the, the doctor's pictures because again, part of this is about knowing that cost and quality are not correlated. Um, and these are family medicine docs who many of them have practiced for many years and became disillusioned with the system that they practice within and really wanted to get back to taking care of patients, spending time with them. Um, we are a physician-only practice. I mentioned that I think we're the largest physician-only practice in Wisconsin and one of the larger ones um, in the Midwest. Uh, we believe in this model that when we can take care of more things in the outpatient setting rather than referring you, we know that non-physician providers refer more, um, order more tests. So again, if the level of training and education allows you to do more in the, the outpatient setting, so we think that controls costs and it's just better care too. Uh, so we right now have 40 plus companies, six of which are self-funded. So one of the questions I always get asked from employers is, you know, well, what if the employees don't come? You know, what, what is utilization gonna be like? Um, and I, my, I, I guess I always have the thought, like if you build it, they will come. And if you provide them really good care and they like their doctor and you can make it accessible to them. Um, but the actual stats say that there's ways to incentivize your employees to utilize this, right? There's, there's carrots and sticks, there's programs you can do to, to get them to come and reward them. There are things you can do that if they don't come, they, you know, their insurance costs more or whatever it is. Uh, we've seen with our businesses, um, the first one to two years, we usually have 60 to 80% utilization. And then by year three, we have 80 to 90. Again, this varies a lot. We have some companies that have 100% utilization because they like literally require their employees to come. Um, but that's one of the... So how much money is it actually going to save? Um, and this is something, I guess I've looked at our our clients, our employers, and then also talk to some other DPC docs around the country. Um, obviously this varies widely, but we see you know, by year two to three, about a 20%, now that's in the overall healthcare spend, because we're referring less, you know, we're, we're sending people less into the system, um, and then 30% by year four. And I show this graphic again, because it's kind of this idea that when we're reducing the amount that we're sending into the hospital-based system, so a 60% reduction in primary care claims, 30% specialist claims, a lot less you know, radiology testing and procedures being done in the hospital, and then a decrease in ER and urgent care visits. So to sum it up, um, healthcare is too expensive. This current system that we're on, I mean, whether you're on board now or a year from now or five years from now, you have to get on board because this it's not going anywhere good right now with the insurance prices. Um, Again, the, the quality of the care, it doesn't matter how much you like that doctor at the, in the big system if you can never get in to see them. Um, and I think this is just gonna continue to grow with direct pay agreements, you know, self-fund health and all the stuff that they're doing. Um, it might not be for every, every company out there, but it's gonna work really well for a lot of people. And you know, even though change, people are, typically are change averse, but I think you know, a lot of people, once they experience this, they are really happy that they made the change.